Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography um, at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, I'm Tom Ash, I'm chair of the, the program. And uh, this spring, our 2023 season is curated by our wonderful uh, faculty member, Elizabeth Abaddon. On her behalf, I'm very proud to introduce our speaker, photographer and activist, Lola Flash. Um, working in the forefront of genderqueer visual politics for more than four decades, Lola Flash's work challenges stereotypes and gender, sexual, and racial preconceptions. Lola received her bachelor's degree from the Maryland Institute uh, College of Art and uh, their master's from the London College of Printing in the UK. An active member of ACT UP during the time when AIDS epidemic was in New York City, Flash was notably featured in the 1989 Kissing Doesn't Kill poster. Lola's work is included in important collections such as the Victoria Albert Museum, MoMA, the Whitney, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Brooklyn Museum. They are currently a proud member of the, the Kumanji uh, Collective and on the board of Queer Art. Lola's art and activism are profoundly connected, fueling a lifelong commitment to visibility and preserving the legacy of LGBTQIA+, and communities of color worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Lola Flash. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming out to hear me talk. Um, so, yeah, I suppose I don't really need to introduce myself again. I'll just get on with the show. <laughs> and I guess I'm just pressing this button. So, uh, my family is really important to me. They've been so supportive. and. Um, I wanted to just start off with my grandmother, my, uh, my, mom, my dad's mother, Lola. Um, there she is, and uh, she was Native American. And so, you know, a lot of people, they say to me, is Lola Flash really your name? And I'm like, well, Lola is really my name. And then I started thinking, like, maybe I should just talk about it a little bit, just kind of like they say, you know, get the elephant out the room. Um, and basically, uh, for most African Americans, our last names are not our last names, right? They're our slave names. And so, I always think about like the need to change my slave name. Um, so I changed it to Flash when I was in college. I just was never happy with my last name. I loved Lola, the name Lola. And uh, so people often think that because I'm a photographer, that's where the Flash comes from. But it actually comes from Grandmaster Flash, who during the 70s when I was in college, believe it or not, um, that his, his music was really popular then. And I thought, Lola, Flash, that has a really good sound to it. So for years I've been calling myself Lola Flash, and others have. So I just wanted you to see a little bit of like how the work looks in situ, as they say. You know, each series has a different size depending upon how I decide to, to make it. You know, like the, the one where uh, the largest ones there, uh, they're shot on a four by five camera, and then they're four foot by five foot prints. Um, and that was at the Pen and Brush Gallery, and, which is really right down the street on 22nd Street, um, right near the Flatiron Building. So if you all don't know about it, it's a wonderful organization. They've been around for over almost 150 years, and they uh, promote women and uh, non-binary non folks' uh, art as well as uh, writing. So they've helped me a lot. They really have supported me in, in a big way. Uh, so I'm going to go kind of chronologically uh, along the, uh, my journey, my long journey. Um, so cross color is a style that I created in, when I was in college. And um, I really like speaking to students because, uh, you know, when I was a student, you know, not to say not to listen to your teachers, but, you know, we listen to our teachers, we learn a lot from them, but sometimes you can have an idea and a teacher might shoot it down. Um, with cross color, my teachers were like, what are you doing, Lola? <laughs> you know, and at first I really didn't know what I was doing. So just to kind of backtrack, um, cross color happens when you use, uh, okay, so also when I was in college, there, were, there was no computers or iPhones. <laughs> so uh, we used the dark room, and uh, I had this Cibachrome paper, which was really expensive, and you printed uh, slides onto Cibachrome paper and got beautiful results. Um, and so 
my dad used to, so I'm from Jersey, my dad and I used to meet in New York, um, and we'd, he'd get me all my supplies and everything, and then I'd go back to Baltimore to, you know, work in the dark room, and, you know, I would always mess up that whole box of Cibachrome paper and be too shy to ask my dad for more, so I thought, what am I going to do with all these slides? So, I've always shot on slide film, That's and still to today, I shoot in 4 by 5 slide. Um, I'm kind of curious, do, do you guys shoot on film? Does anyone shoot on film? Some people do. Great. That's good to see. Um, and so, uh, anyway, I started sh t printing the, four of the, the slide film onto negative paper, and I got negative color, right? You, s you print a negative onto negative paper, you get a positive image, and so I printed a positive onto a negative, and I got negative color. Um, and so, like I said, my t teacher was like, what are you doing, Lola? And I, I was just like, I don't know. I just love the color. And so, as I was creating this work, I realized that I was making black people white and white people black, right? And as I started working more on, on this series or this style, I realized that I can make people purple and green and, uh, you know, really move away from this idea of, like, this binary idea of color, right? Um, and obviously, being a black person, you know, I remember when I was a kid and, um, uh, I was, I've always been a little bit of a nerd. I loved dictionaries. And so I remember reading in the dictionary, like, black was bad, dirty, ugly, and white was pure, perfect, you know? And so I don't remember ever talking to my parents about it, but I know that was something that sort of sat with me. Um, and so the cross color kind of like helped me sort of just see things as I saw it and see, to see things just kind of like without those kinds of overtones. I spent 40 years creating work, um, actually probably even longer, but when I was a kid, I had a camera when I was about seven, and uh, you know, I took pictures of my fish, fish, like my fish tank and things like that, so I wasn't really w making images that sort of were ready to rock the world, but I think that it kind of created this um, kind of always looking at things and framing them for, for most of my life. Um, and so th what I was gonna tell you was like this picture here um, that I took in Providence, Provincetown, probably in, in the early 90s, uh, is actually in the um, collection of, of MoMA. So I'm quite happy about that because this work I did for about 20 years, and people would say, you know, after college, you know, I just kept doing this kind of work, and, and people would say, Lola, you're still doing that weird color? And I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, it never seemed to catch on, and I think that could be like a whole nother, like, that could be like a master's, really. But, you know, I think part of it had to do with the fact that color was you know, sort of this new thing, color photography. My teachers just liked black and white. They were, they all looked like Ansel Adams, and they loved him. And I love Ansel Adams now, but I was just kind of like, there's more to photography than that. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so just to say to you, you guys who are, are in school, like, if there's something that you're doing that you really love, like, just keep with it, you know? It might not bring you fame or glory, but it'll bring you happiness. Um, so when I got out of college in 1981, uh, was the first year that someone was, uh, uh, someone was reported to have HIV AIDS. Um, most of us activists know that people were, had HIV earlier than that, but that's when it um, appeared in the New York Times. Um, and so I kind of felt like, I mean, I got out of college and then before I knew it, like there was this AIDS epidemic, you know, and I felt like I couldn't just take pretty pictures. And to be honest with you, I used to always say, like when I um, would like blow my can the, the candle out for my birthday cake, I would always wish for an end to AIDS. Um, and as you know, there's no, there's no cure for AIDS at the moment. Um, it's much better, people are living with AIDS, um, but there still is no cure. Um, so this picture is uh, from, as you said, uh, 1989. Um, it, it went on the size of buses uh, nationally. Uh, it says, kissing doesn't kill, greed and indifference do. And the bottom tagline could really just, if you, if you changed uh, AIDS to COVID, it really is the same thing. Corporate greed, government inaction, and public indifference makes AIDS a political crisis. All right? It's still affecting, COVID is still affecting those people who don't have insurance, right? Those people who are poor. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, Although a lot of people did think that it was just a gay disease, most people who were informed knew that there were a lot of people, who, poor people, who, who um, had AIDS. So uh, that's me on the end with the hoop earrings. I was having a really good hair day. Um, <laughs> I just kind of went bloop and it just stayed there. And, 
uh, you know, we used to do a lot of, um, uh, this is also, I'm sorry, this was also when people thought that you could contract AIDS from kissing. And so we used to always have these like kiss-ins where we would just go to different stores or different people, you know, different places that had done something anti-queer um, and we would just have these kiss-ins so, or we'd stop traffic and we'd just start kissing each other and they'd be like, oh, they'd be like that person just kissed a girl, they just kissed a boy, you know, they were really freaking out that we were kissing each other, um, showing love to each other, right? Um, and so this same, same thing, you know, we went to this, this uh, loft in um, Tribeca and we just kissed all the different people and uh, they, ch they ended up cho choosing uh, myself and Julie Tolentino, who was actually my girlfriend at the time. So it was kind of sweet until we broke up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are some more images that I took uh, during ACT UP. And I felt that the cross color really worked. You know, this was like a beautiful Kodak day. It's an ad that was quite popular when I was a kid. Um, you know, so I have. You know, the blue sky, uh, you know, becomes a warm orange color. Of course, the, the darkness are the white clouds. Um, and I think it just kind of, you know, some people say I kind of was queering the color, um, but I think it really looks kind of volatile in the way that it was. And then this was the, the first time I actually saw the, the AIDS quilt. So the AIDS quilt was something that was created, I believe, in 89 or 90. And uh, people would uh, make quilt sections for each of their, you know, loved ones. And, uh, you know, when I saw that flash, it just kind of stopped me uh, in my tracks. And I just thought to myself how lucky I was to, to be healthy. Um, and just, you know, it was a lot, a lot of emotions. That time, uh, I don't know um, how we did it, to be honest with you. Um, this is another picture that's in, um, in the MoMA. My, my friend Charles, um, who unfortunately passed away from, from AIDS. Um, and he might even have been sick uh, when I took this picture. Um, he, like many people, uh, was ashamed of being sick, so he didn't tell, tell us. Um, the, it has kind of like a double meaning, it's obviously banned aid, banned AIDS, and also, uh, you know, I try not to say back in the day too much, but back in the day, uh, you know, the, there weren't like Mickey Mouse um, Band-Aids, right? The, the, they either were like, this pinky color that really didn't match anyone's color, but especially not ours. And so I knew that if I put the, the Band-Aids onto Charles and then made it look sort of, uh, you know, dial in the filter so that it was more purple, it would look like Carposis. And Carposis was as a skin cancer that a lot of people who were HIV positive got in the beginning. And then they, they had um, drugs that stopped that. But it was really very embarrassing for, for people and it made them stay inside. Uh, this is for Ray. Um, and I, I, you know, I'd love to tell you stories about everyone, but I'll tell you this one. So this is actually going to be, uh, you'll see it around town, I'm going to be in a group show uh, at, the, at the Whitney, and they're using this picture, they, they acquired this work, I think last year, and it's called Foray, and so it's going to be hopefully all over. Um, but this was a morning when I woke up and I went to the, the um, beach in Provincetown, and I saw this wheelchair standing there, uh, sitting there, and I just thought, you know, who's using, who's using this? I didn't see anyone differently abled at all. And, uh, you know, I looked around for a while and I just thought, you know what it is? I bet you it's Ray. Ray had just passed away, my friend, just passed away a couple of months before. And I thought, I bet you Ray wanted to come to the beach with me. And there he is. You know, and so I think that we, my age group, we kind of learned how to, to deal with death, in a, you know, very early on in our lives. Um, and, you know, you can't be sad about it all the time. You have to sort of reinvent the motions. That's my butt. I, I sort of did self-portraits all the way through my career. So this is a mini lesson part. Um, I used to be a teacher. I retired about a year ago. And um, so I'm sure you all, because you're all art students, you've seen this before, right? There's two faces, right? Not if you know. Yeah, right, yeah, OK. Okay, so I don't have to go through the young lady and the older lady. Okay, and what about this one? Does everyone know the symbol? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, okay. Okay, so just make sure we're on the same page. So yeah, between the E and the X, thanks for showing. Yeah, if your friends don't know it, please show it. Because you never, you won't ever not see it. Once, it's, once you see it, you can't not stop seeing it, right? And so the point of, of this little mini lesson is just to say that, 
as you look through my work or even as you walk through the streets, you know, do your best not to, to make your biases come into play. I mean, we all have biases, even us black people have biases, right, against rich people, people who are differently shaped or, uh, you know, the way people dress, right? I mean, how many people, how many, uh, like, black men have been killed because they wore hoodies, you know? I mean, Trayvon Martin just had his birthday, would have had his 20th birthday on Sunday, and um, so someone who is obviously black, um, I think a lot about the way that people perceive me. And when Barack was elected, you know, even like um, Muhammad Ali was talking about the White House, black people used to say, why do you think they call it the White House before B Barack, you know, was in? Um, and so I think most of us, again, my age group, we were never expected to have a black president. Um, but when Barack was, was elected, I actually used to get on the bus feeling a little bit better. Like I thought, you know, the ladies, I have to say the white ladies aren't going to grab their bag, so, you know, as if I was going to take it. They're going to think, maybe even think, she might even have a college degree, you know. It was, it'd be a lot for them, me to, for, you know, have two masters, but I'm not bragging, but it's just kind of like, when you look at me, when the, when the world looks at me, I don't think they see that. Um, thankfully now that the acquisitions are coming through, um, I'm getting, like, I feel like the respect that I've kind of worked through or wanted or needed. Um, and so that's a good thing. So when you look at the work, just please w move away from your, whatever your mom taught you, your teachers, th what the media tells us, and just look at the beauty within them because that's really where my work comes from. So I'm going to show you several series. Um, this is Surmise, and it's about, um, I guess it's about people who are gender fluid and for people who just really want to present themselves in their own way, not the way that the media tells them to. Um, and I love to sort of, I mean, each of my series I love, so I can't say that I love everyone, but, you know, in this series, I really just kind of tell people to wear whatever they feel really good in. I don't, you know, instruct them what to wear, um, and I don't even instruct them how to pose. Um, these are four by five, um, but now what I've been doing, because there's no more Polaroid film uh, for the four by five cameras, so I, uh, I actually do use a digital camera and just spend maybe five or ten minutes having people kind of move around and then we look through the pictures and see what pose we want to do and then I get, you know, get the four by five out. Um, you know, I use a white background so that I, it, it, um, it one has um, continuity so wherever I, I photograph um, it always, always looks the same and uh, I suppose a little bit of Richard Avedon's influence has come through and even sometimes looking at the poses that some of the, I think it's called The Americans, that, that series that he did. Um, oh, and those were in the New York Times. That's these, they actually hired me to do a, a, f a series for a Pride last year. Um, this is Utah, my good friend. Uh, pretty much all the people in my work, in my, um, work are my friends or m my friend's parents or whatever. <laughs> um, Legends is, um, Legends is actually the first series I did with digital. Um, I think even my friend Ron might have been one of those people who works in a camera shop and they'd say, Lola, there's something called digital. <laughs> and I'm like, digital, what's that? You know, I was, I was so like, I love my 4x5 camera um, and, you know, but I was like that even with tennis, like when the Lumina Records came in, um, I stayed with my, my uh, wooden racket forever and then I was just like okay I guess everyone all the pros are doing it so I guess I'll change but you know change is hard anyway this series I decided to do on um, with, with digital a digital camera um, it started because uh, and many of my series start because of something that's happened to me so rather than be angry I create and so this one started because um, I was at Joe's pub one of my favorite places to go see entertainment um, and so this uh, trans act actor came in, and I think I was just excited from the show that I was going to see. I might have had a drink or two, and uh, I see this person come in, and I ran up to them, and I was like, "Have you ever seen this? You know, have you ever seen this this um, performance? Blah blah blah." And they looked at me, and they were like, "Do I know you?" And I was like, "Oh my God! I just I didn't expect that to happen. I really thought that." they were just going to be nice to me or just say no and just keep it moving, you know. 
Um, and so I kind of went back to my table with my tail between my legs and um, I have like a kind of slow, I don't know if anyone else has this, but I kind of have a slow reaction. Like it kind of sometimes take me, takes me 24 hours to, to know if I'm angry, sad, mad. You know, and a lot of times it's like, um, it's too late to holler at the people because I'm like, you know, I missed that, that opportunity. But I woke up the next morning and I thought to myself, you know, they bloody well should know who I am. It's people like me and others who have helped her be able to sashay across the TV screen in a dress. And I think that, you know, history is important. Um, and, you know, for people of color and for queer people, a lot of times those histories aren't written, but there's people who can tell you about it. You know, if you can, you can investigate and you can find out answers and just know where your privilege comes from. So, what I, oops, well, so what did I do? I decided to make a series of people who are similar to me, similar age, um, who, you know, when I grew up, there was no L word, there was no, uh, you know, on the subways or the, the billboards, there weren't queer people, you know. Um, and so I just, you know, I told my mom when I was four, I was like, no more dresses, mom. I was like, uh-uh, I don't like these. You know, she kind of felt bad that she'd been putting me in dresses all this time, bless her. Um, and so these are people, uh, similar to myself, and, and it's funny because none of them really think of themselves as legends. They're just kind of doing their own thing, you know, but in my eyes, I think that they're legends, and it's kind of a beautiful family, I feel. Um, and I just, you know, thought that the black background sort of, I started off with more, uh, more sort of actors and um, drag queens and things like that, and I just thought that the black background and sort of the kind of siloed light, lighting kind of worked with, with this series. That is um, Buck Angel and Lena, uh, Lena, she's a DJ. Sorry, I forgot her last name. This is um, Cheryl Donier um, and uh, Robin, Robin Cloud. They're both filmmakers. Um, that's Augusto over there. He used to be, do drag when he was younger. He's lovely. We, um, he doesn't really have any kind of internet or anything, so we, we're like pen pals. We write each other notes. Um, and this, this is my dear friend Campbell X, who's also a filmmaker. So I know this looks really crazy, but I just wanted to talk about research. And, you know, one of the things I love about the cell phone is that, you know, you can just do screenshots, right? So a lot of these are screenshots of things I've seen, and then I just create, a, I'll show you in a second, my Syzygy series, which was the first slide. Um, but anything that I think that might work so far as a pose, background, or whatever, I just have like a Syzygy album. Maybe you all do this too, but it's, it's really important. Or even some of this, these things like, um, like those there. That's all from the, the Met. So I'm looking at the way that people are posing, strong poses, so that when I do my, my, my little posing thing that I can have some reference. You know, it's, research is really important. Uh, here's another example. Um, I love the way that um, this is Toyen. I'm sorry, I've forgotten her last name too. But Toyen's is the painting on on the left hand side. Um, and so this woman with the uh, that I photographed here on, on the, with the blue on, she had this um, piano, and I was thinking, how could I use this piano? I just couldn't figure out how I could get her to be next to the piano. Um, and so I just started looking through Toyen's work, and then I saw this. And even though that's just a table. It gave me the idea of how to pose this woman, you know. So again, it's really, I mean, I think it's kind of fun to to look at other people's work and then to kind of reinvent it, I suppose. And here's just one more I wanted to show you. Um, this is uh, James Carey Marshall uh, on the left hand side, and this is a picture of me. Uh, I was at the I do more and more. I've been doing residencies, and this one is at the um, Center for Photography at Woodstock. And um, they give you a whole house. And so when I went upstairs to the, uh, to the attic, it's like sort of an attic studio kind of thing, I just immediately thought about this painting. And so I, I, I rec recreated it you know, in my own kind of way, obviously not exact, but um, I used it as, as sort of an impetus. Uh, and it was fun. I've never really worked like that before, but it was, it was kind of, I, I enjoyed it. And I love his work. So it's, it, this one is uh, called a hom homage to um, Carrie James Marshall. So I am just breezing through here. Everyone good? 
Yeah, okay. Um, so this is um, the last series I'll be showing you. Um, it's called Syzygy the Vision, and it was actually created in uh, Woodstock. So uh, it's kind of funny, I was, let's see, this was 2019, yeah. And so 2018 was kind of a crazy year. It was kind of the beginning of uh, people noticing me and reaching out to me. I did, I did some work for the Smithsonian. Um, New York Times wrote some, yeah. So, you know, it started, started picking up a little bit. And so I actually applied to the residency and I said, I really just want to break. I just want to read. I don't really want to produce anything. Um, but I ended up meeting this woman, Jayashree, who's a curator. And she said, um, she, I don't know if anyone saw these shows, but she cur curated these amazing shows at the Ford Foundation a couple years ago. And I um, was dying to be in one of them. So anyway, she said, you know, if I, that the, the series was, I mean, the show was going to be around Afrofuturism. And if I could get something together, um, like within two weeks, that she would put me in the show. So I was like, yes. So, you know, I, I was actually in London when we spoke. So I, you know, I ran to my friend's flat. Um, I ordered the helmet because I thought Afrofuturism, like a helmet is important. And then when I got the helmet, I realized that it had this orange trim. Um, and for years, um, I've been frustrated with the penal system here, um, worried, saddened, so much. Um, and so I've, I have a lot of like prison uniforms. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to use the orange prison uniform to match that. And then, of course, the symbol of the, the handcuff, uh, you know, either closed or open, it, it says freedom or not, right? Freedom or lack of freedom. Um, and water has always been a really important part of, of my uh, work, I guess my life. I mean, again, as African Americans, that's how we got here. Well, the brave ones. Well, I don't even know. I shouldn't say the brave ones. The ones who decided not to jump ship, right? And so for me, I think about those who did jump ship and, you know, like what happened to them? Like, did they turn into like mermaids and mermen? Or, you know, are they down there? with afros and playing cards and tricky beer. I don't know. Um, we don't know, do we? But um, yeah, so uh, there's a spiritual side of, you know, seriously, there's a spiritual side of, um, of the water to me. I don't always talk about it. I, in talks I do, but like, if you read something in a museum about it, it probably wouldn't say anything about it, but um, it is important. So I just kind of Googled sites that have beautiful water places, and I came up with this, with this is the Ashokan River, Re Ashokan Reservoir, right near Woodstock. Um, so this was the beginning of, the of, series, of this series. I didn't really see it as a series, but as COVID came in 220, um, I was worried to do my, I didn't want to do photograph people. I mean, I know some of my friends were still photographing, but I felt uncomfortable, especially because I have like a, I have an older lady series, which I haven't shown you, but um, you know, I didn't want to go. That's what I usually do in this, in the winter time, I usually do like my indoor stuff. So, you know, that's what I would normally do in this, uh, in the winter, but I didn't because I was worried that I would, you know, bring COVID in. Um, so I started taking advantage of the quiet city. Um, as soon as they announced that they were gonna clean the subways, I was down there. Um, none of my friends wanted to come. So <laughs> I just grabbed my, my tripod and, um, you know, cause it was kind of scary. I mean, I, I, the older I get, the more scary I feel like the subway is at night. Um, but it was particularly scary. I don't know if you guys went there during, during COVID, but, um, you know, the poor homeless people were down there and, you know, it was, it was sad. Anyway, um, I got, got my tripod out. As I got my tripod out, this homeless, young homeless guy r runs by me, screaming that he's hungry. It really shook me. Um, I could, so much so that I couldn't remember how to put my camera on automatic. I know, I know, Ron. Um, but anyway, I figured it out and I think I must've gotten like maybe four or five shots that were in focus. The camera just didn't know where to focus, but I, I got lucky and, and I got this one. This one is actually in the, um, one of the ones that's in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, so then Mr. Floyd was killed, you know, and, and the city, there were still parts of the city that was quiet, but the city, I mean, I just heard like um, helicopters around my apartment. Um, and so I decided to, uh, to take Syzygy to a demonstration. And actually my friend here, Ron, uh, photographed me. He lives in Harlem. So I went up to Harlem and we, uh, 
we did some, some shots. So a lot of these I actually are having my friends photograph me. Um, I think probably because when I started off I was doing it in COVID and it was just kind of like, let's get out and photograph really quickly and get back in. Um, and so I just got really used to that. Um, a lot of times I'll tell them, you know, I'll put them in the position um, and then I'll take a picture and I'll be like, that's what I want to look like. Um, sometimes I let them freestyle, but mostly I usually know what I want, so, uh, yeah. So, some of the places, you know, it just happens to be because I'm on holiday and I take photographs. Um, another, it's kind of, I think, the, being a photographer, I think it's really hard. I don't know about you all, but it's, I, for me, I find it really hard to just be on holiday. You know, it's like, should I bring the 4 by 5 Should I bring the digital camera? Should I... You know, it's, it's, I just feel, always feel like I don't want to miss an opportunity. Um, this one is a, is a shot taken in Tulsa. Um, so there are some areas where I target where there has been a lot of trauma uh, for black folks. Um, and I kind of, kind of emote or I think about the feelings. I listen to the ancestors and, I, and it kind of helps me figure out what kind of pose I want to do. Um, and this is called Stairway to Nowhere. Um, and basically, in Tulsa, I'm sure most of you know that all the houses were burned, all the black houses were burned um, by the white people because they were like tired of these black people having money and they were like gone with you. And so what happened was like all the houses burned down, but the steps, because they were, were rock uh, or cement or whatever, they didn't burn. So there's just like a strip that's, I don't know, maybe six or seven football feels large, or maybe even larger, that just have these kind of steps and then a plateau. Um, yeah. um, these next two are actually are from my residency that I just finished uh, in the Everglades, the Florida Everglades. Um, this is called a solution hole. I don't really remember exactly how it's made, but the, the earth makes it. It's one of my favorite places. Um, it was really beautiful there. Um, it was scary and beautiful, you know, seeing alligators over, like as close as like you girls are. They're like they're alligators, like it's like okay. Um, but then like the birds, you know, um, my partner was saying it looks like I was in Jurassic Park. Um, but it was really beautiful. Um, if you all haven't been there, it's just uh, yeah. It's it's some places don't even look like you're in America, um, and uh, you know from. I have to say, from watching movies, usually it's like the black person that that's, gets killed first. And so I was like, is the boogeyman going to come get me? Because I was actually living in the Everglades, and it was dark at night, so, so dark. Um, but I actually just kind of said to myself, you know, if this is where it's going to happen, then, you know, she died doing what she loved doing, you know. Um, and it really kind of helped me, because then I started really thinking about my grandmother, because the Native Americans lived in... Uh, in the Everglades, and uh, I don't know if she did, but you know, because I, I never got to meet her, unfortunately. But you know, maybe her uh, her grandmother or great grandmother lived there, and so I really started to like work towards listening to their whispers, um, and uh, it was really, um, you know, and just also being like in these vast areas where there's hardly anyone. You know, when I came home and like I live on Second Avenue. And, when I look out, I see all these windows. I mean, I see, yeah, I'll see all these little windows, and I'm thinking, there's people in all those windows. You know what I mean? It was just such a, a drastic change from being in the Everglades. I mean, when I'm at home and I, you know, I do a, a drop from my phone to, from my computer to my phone, an airdrop, like other phones come up that aren't even in my apartment. You know what I mean? It's kind of like people are everywhere here in New York, and that was just, there was just something very beautiful about not being around a lot of people. And it changes all the time too. Now, this where I photographed this, um, I went back. One of the things that's great about having a residency is that you have time to go back and redo things. Like, uh, and so I went back to redo something further down the, the sort of walkway. Uh, but this was all in water, uh, so I got lucky being able to photograph that day. So it's not all doom and gloom, right? Um, you know, being a black person, even being enslaved. Uh, you know, we, we have found joy in our lives. Um, and so with this project, I'm kind of, uh, I'm not working in it in a sort of like uh, chronological way. I, I think of them more as like post-it notes. So I'll kind of, 
you know, I don't know, TV, you see writers and they have post-it notes and they're moving it all around. And so I kind of feel like that's what I'm doing with these. And so I'll sort of have, you know, sort of intense parts and then it'll kind of go down to sort of happier parts and it'll sort of have a flow um, in the way that movies or even, even mu music does. Um, so this one is it's me down in Jersey actually, you know, eating a chocolate and white um, um, cone and I just love this kind of old school look and, I, and the fact that it was called Milky Way just really f fit in with my, you know, Afrofuturist uh, ideas. Um, yeah, so this, as again, it, there's, there's some happy parts. And so now, this is the last slide. You guys have been really a great audience, I appreciate it. Don't see many people, no, I don't see anyone on their phone, so thank you. That's like the teacher ahead coming back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this photograph is about legacy. Um, it's really, legacy and family, like I said earlier, is really important to me. Um, you know, I was always very different. I, you know, my, other, my cousins all have long hair. Um, I always played with the boys. I guess, you know, when I was young, they called me a tomboy. Um, and my family did never care. Um, when I got to high school, I still was like doing the tomboy thing, and I think they thought I might grow out of it. But I, I obviously, I've never have. In fact, my dad used to always take me to the, the store. Uh, we used to go to the store in um, in Newark, an Army Navy store, and uh, we would go straight to the boys' department. You know, I didn't have to like fluff around the girls' department. Like they were like, "This is Lola, and we and we love her." And uh, as I've gotten older, um, I realized that a lot of my friends uh, haven't had that same uh, support in their, in their families. Uh, so not only do I have a supportive family, but I have supportive friends as well. So um, I, I'm feeling blessed, and the older I get, I just feel more and more blessed. I don't know if that's about aging or what, but uh, yeah, thankful. So this is uh, my great-grandfather at the very end there with the, the, the mustache and the hat. Um, this is Madam C.J. Walker, and that is I don't know why I can never remember. Can you guys help me? Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington. Thank you, Jean. Yeah, Booker T. Washington, and and the other people I don't know their names, but um, basically my great grandfather, uh, he his job was to create these wise in different places. So I think this was in. I think it might have been in Kentucky. I'm not sure, but he did. He he started a Y in Brooklyn. Um, and he started a Y in Montclair, which is where I'm from, and that's why I, I ended up being born there. Um, but back then, they, they were called the colored Ys, right? So they, they weren't integrated during the Jim Crow days. And so, you know, it was one of the few places where black people were actually were able to, um, to go. So they went there for parties. They went there to learn how to swim. Uh, some of them, uh, especially the guys, got scholarships to college. You know, it was like a mecca for many, many places uh, in America where black people were, didn't have, were, weren't allowed to go anywhere. Um, and so they also learned to read. Uh, so, you know, this was probably uh, an opening for, for the why. Um, and they, those two were probably benefactors because they, they had a lot of money back then. Um, and so they probably were, you know, donated money for the, for the cause. And so, you know, my grandfather knew back then that black people deserved equity. And so for, for me, oh, and I like to say, uh, if you don't have like a Charles H. Bullock in your family, you can be that person. You can start the legacy, right? It's like, don't feel bad if you don't have a Charles H. Bullock. Or, but I bet you a lot of you do have those people in your, in your family that you admire and that help you um, sort of know who you are. Um, so I feel like I kind of took the baton from my, 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 my great-grandfather and kind of ran with it, you know. And I think about in maybe a hundred years' time, because this was, a, I believe this was photographed in around 1920, so it would have been a little bit over a hundred years ago. So in a hundred years, I, I hope that one of my, uh, you know, cousin's kids or some family member is an artist and they are uh, giving a talk to a bunch of lovely people like yourself. And uh, they, they'll say, uh, and here's a picture of my, uh, you know, my auntie or whatever, uh, Lola Flash. And uh, there's Michelle Obama and Deborah Willis. And 
Rihanna or Beyonce, either one. <laughs> you know, and so you know because it, it's important to to you know we all of us need to you know what they say you have to um, you have to see it to be it. You know, and I think that that's what my grandfather, my great grandfather, showed showed us, our whole family. You know, we're very proud of him, and um, yeah. So, thanks, great granddaddy. You know, I'm, I'm I'm doing my best, and uh, I appreciate you all. Thanks for coming. Um, one, I guess we're doing qu answer questions. Yeah. So one thing I meant to mention is that I have a book that I did not bring. Uh, but it's just coming out. It's dropping, as they say, on February 28th, um, and it's it's uh, print, being printed by the New Press. So it's really very reasonably priced, um, you know, so that it's uh, affordable and accessible. And which project? It's pretty much my whole life stuck in there. Yeah, it's my first book. What's the title? It's called Believable. And just really quickly, since you asked the title, um, so uh, again. When I talk about, I'm still really not so used to um, talking about the acquisitions and these kind of things. It, it feels like bragging, um, and I was not, I was raised not to to brag, um, but at the same time, I know, right? I'm supposed to, yeah, but it's kind of a anyway. So believable. When when things started happening finally, um, you know, uh, I was saying to to my fiance. Um, I was like, it's so unbelievable. This is so unbelievable. And she was just like, after I said it a couple of times, she was just like, Lola, you're believable. Stop it. So I stopped it and I named the book Believable. Yeah. So I'm ready for your questions, you guys. Round of applause for that. All right. I'm going to ask one if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some of our students here. They're st working on their, starting their thesis projects. And so you've done a lot of these different projects. And I love that you brought up research as part of your process. Any other advice you have to people who are starting long-term projects and, and uh, ways, ways to approach it, ways to approach failing <laughs> and, and, tr and trying new things and doing things on the way? Yeah, I mean, um, again, I think like cross-color was a mistake. And so I think it's a really good example of how mistakes can turn into something that goes into a museum. Mm -hmm. um, I think, again, you know, research. I also have a lot of uh, friends who help me, especially now that I'm starting to work with the digital camera, um, with the 4x5, four, four because, um, you know, I've been a teacher all my life and, uh, in New York, so that means I'm broke. <laughs> um, and so I would only shoot, like, maybe six, six slides, like, for, for my 4x5 camera. So I, you know, I knew that was a shot, right? But now with the, with the digital, I'm finding I have a lot more shots that could be good. And so I send them to my friends. And what I do is I, I send one to like uh, a straight friend, a gay friend, a black friend, a white friend, just to kind of get like a, a sense of like what they like. Even though usually it's the one I like, I, you know, I usually go with the one I like, but I just kind of like to see. So I think it's good to, to make sure that you're I don't know, that you have a diversity in your friends um, and, and use them as sort of a, a litmus test. Um, museums, uh, you know, again, when I was younger, I, I was, museums were white walls and white people in them. And so I, I you know, I only went to them when my teachers forced me to go. <laughs> and um, so I, but I think, you know, museums and galleries, museums are, you know, uh, they're changing, and I don't think that all institutions are changing, and there's still a lot of lip surface and ticking of the boxes, but like, like with MoMA, you know, they say to me, um, they like, they thank me, um, they just seem to really love me, and uh, yeah, they're so thankful to have my work there, and they're like, Lola, you know, we know we should have done this, you know, that's work from the 80s, they, 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 they know they should have gotten work from me back then. Um, but it's progress, and you know, and I think as long as you see people making progress, then I think that what can you do? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I think talking to different friends, having uh, multiple, mo uh, different kinds of friends to talk to, um, museums, books, reading. Mm -hmm. I guess just the kind of usual. But I think I think the diversity of, of, of friends and and eyes on the images helps you kind of get a, a more rounder view 
because we have cultural differences around color and all kinds of things. So I think it's important to kind of, yeah, like you might be saying something really not cool for one culture. That's right. And you don't want to do that. No, it's, it's really great to have yeah, this idea of having open, being open to other perspectives. And that's it's, it's brave to do, too, at the same time. But it's, like you said, friends, people who are going to, I mean, be honest and supportive, hopefully, at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, and yeah. I mean, being in New York, you guys are so lucky to have so much, so many places for art. Um, right. It's amazing. Though I was, I was just said, um, I went to the Cincinnati Photo Fest this year, and that was amazing. I don't know if you've ever been. It's, there's art, there's photos everywhere, photography everywhere. It's really, I was really surprised. Thank you, thanks so much for this. Um, two kind of unrelated questions. I'm just curious what the residency is like upstate and down in Florida. What, do, what does that entail and what, what is that kind of process like and how does that work? Is that a, how long does it last and you know, what does that entail? Um, and then my totally separate question is, when you're working in the studio, do you, you talked a lot about music, do you ever use music when you're working with subjects, do you listen to music or do you like to keep it quiet? Thanks. Yeah, we usually have like music, little music in the background, um, but it's not like uh, we're not partying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do sometimes use music in the background. You know, I think I do so much work outside, and I feel like I haven't done any anything indoors in such a long time. I'm just starting to to work indoors. Um, and uh, the residencies are great. I mean, I, I never went on a residency before um, because I was like, usually they're out, like they're not in the city. A lot of them aren't. And, uh, you know, I mean, as you can see from my work, I really uh, photograph mostly people of color. And so I was like, why am I going to go out there and there's not going to be anyone for me to photograph, you know. But now I realize that I can actually bring, photograph a lot before and then work on you know, editing and things like that, printing. Um, and then I'm like actually am more open to things. So I, you know, I do some, some nature shots, which I was like, never take it. Like I said, I never take a beautiful picture, right? But I realized after all this time, like I had to like give myself a break. So I feel like my, I, I didn't really show you any of my um, landscape stuff, but I always feel like that's kind of like my watercolors. And residencies can be, Two, a week to two weeks to two years, it depends. There are, there are so many different kinds. And um, you know, the I would say the application process is very, uh, can be challenging. Um, the Center for Photography, Woodstock, I, I'm actually gonna be a judge uh, for, for the, the, uh, the next round of, of residence. Um, but I actually applied twice to that back in the day to finally get it. So, you know, sometimes you end up having to to apply more than once. Some of them are more like McDowell is like one of the most prestigious ones and they, they bring you uh, they bring you like a little basket of food, like you have your own little uh, little sort of cabin and they bring you like a little bag, a, a ba basket of lunch and then you're meant to go hang out with everybody. Um, all the ones I've done so far, it's always just been me. Uh, so that's why I was so scary in the Everglades because I was just there, me with, the, with my ancestors. Um, and uh, yeah, they're they're fun. I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I try not to to uh, be like shoulda, coulda, woulda. But in some ways, I wish I had done that more, done more residencies, because it's just nice to be able to. And most of them are free. I mean, there's some where you have to pay, but most of them they they actually pay you, you know, for like food and stuff like that. So it's um really wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I love it. Thanks for your questions. Um, just one little. Hey, what is no? Just, I just it's for the it's for the taping. I just want to know what residency is. Just a what the residency is. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, no, that's you only learn. It drives me nuts when people don't ask questions. Uh, you know, it's the only way you learn, right? So a residency, a lot of times, like for instance, the uh, the one I uh, this one. Uh, so that one I did airy. It's called AIRI, A-I-R-I-E. And they're an organization that, that actually, um, and more and more places are doing this, they actually partner with the, uh, with the parks department. So I mean, so this, the Everglades is a national park, right? And so they actually partner with them. 
So like I had one of my photo shoots, I actually had uh, one of the uh, rangers help me photograph because my assistant was late. So a residency is a, a place where some of them, actually you don't even have to do any work. Some of them are just like, artists need to rest, so we're gonna let you come and rest. Um, I just applied to one in Japan, which I'm hoping for. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna photograph like older people there because they have this amazing welfare uh, system for older people in Japan. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a place that you go and you either create work or you chill. Um, sometimes they have different things like, uh, you have to like do a, a talk. Uh, I did one in, in a Fire Island where I had to do like a, every Thursday I had to like program a film. So they all take different, all have different things. The one in Fire Island was amazing because they also bought me food. So like say I had like six friends visiting. The they gave me a whole house with three bedrooms. Um, they, I, ha I did an order, a food order every day, uh, I mean every week. And so I'd say, oh, I'm having six friends this week, so can I get like some salmon, some whatever? And they bring like six slabs, slabs of salmon. And you know, my fridge was so full by the end. We were, I was just like, eat the food, eat the food. You know, so I've never had that before. But yeah, it's just an opportunity for artists to, to find their, you know, find, to read. That's what I do. I, I find I, I have better concentration when I'm on my residency, you know, so I don't have to worry about my bills or my friends know not to bother me, um, you know what I mean? And like I said, they're usually in places that are pretty desolate, so, um, like I had to rent a car for that, pl for that because I didn't, you know, there was no, no getting around without one. But they're a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. All right, more questions? All right, well thank no you, Little Flash. Come Appreciate on, you guys. <laughs> well, That's it? Hang on. It was, it's not really a question. I just wanted to ask you about some of the places, because you were talking about the, the Museum of African American History and Culture, MoMA, and what were some of the other places you have your work in? The Whitney. The Whitney. Yeah, so the Whitney, did I say earlier? No, that there's gonna be a show um, uh, August in August that opens up. Oh yeah, I did mention that, right, when I showed you the, the picture of Ray. So that's gonna be open this summer, so a group show. I think there's uh, three other photographers um, and so, you know, when, you're, when your work is acquired, when one's work is acquired, um, they, uh, you never know when they're going to show it, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's like, it's going to be in this dark room forever. Um, and so, uh, I was really excited to know that they were going to show it. And then to, to use my picture, that was really kind of exciting. Um, yeah, so, and also, they were paying me, so that was something else I didn't know. When, when the work went up in MoMA, um, MoMA bought seven, and, um, when the work went, oh, let's just go back to the one that, one said, um, when MoMA bought the work and then they hung it, I was just so happy that, you know, it was, that it was hanging. I didn't think about payment, you know? And then, uh, then the Whitney said, oh, you know, we're gonna, we wanna use your work um, and we'll pay you um, to, and they, this is something that they just started doing two years ago where they're actually paying artists whose work is in the collections to show their work, which seems fair, right? It's, it's a new thing. So, I mean, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm a lifelong learner, and it's really interesting learning how the things work. You also get like a, again, I'm not bragging, but you also get a, a lifetime membership. So, um, yeah, so Whitney has like lifetime written over it in silver letters. And then MoMA, MoMA has expiration date, my, Mo, my MoMA card has expiration date of 2050. And that's when they think I'm not gonna be around anymore. So I'm like, that's, I'll be like, can anyone do the math? That's 20, 27 years from now, so I'll be uh, 90, 90 something. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine I'm just gonna like, I'm gonna have my little cane, I'm gonna walk in there, I'm gonna be like, this is inspired, give me another one. I'm still here, you know. <laughs> um, but you know, you just don't, I mean, I don't have friends that are in museums, so I don't really know the, the way that things go, you know, so, you know, it's, it's just, yeah, anyway, it, it's, it's pretty exciting to, to be, uh, to finally be seen. I just wanna say one thing. Mm -hmm. You were talking about bragging. I've known you a long time, and I just have to tell the story. I come home one day and I, I'm a member of the African American Museum of History and Culture. And I opened up an envelope 
and it's a calendar. And guess who's the cover? Yeah. I went nuts. Yeah, it was uh, this picture. And I didn't even know. Someone on Facebook wrote, like, said, um, I voted for you. I'm like, what are you talking about? And so it turns out that they have this, every year they have this uh, vote for the, the people, the members. And so I, I won. Uh, I thought that was kind of cool because it's, it's the people, you know, it's not like the smart curators or, you know, arty people. It's like the actual peoples that, that voted for this picture. So I was pretty excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. And Ron, Ron works at a, can I say? Photo Care. So Ron has helped me, like, buy my cameras. He tells me how it works. Um, I remember when you, the, I used the, um, the uh, GFX 100, the Fuji GFX 100, which I love. And I remember the first time you showed it to me, Ron, and I was just like, mine, mine. I, I didn't want to let go of it. And I was just like, how am I going to afford to buy this camera, you know? Um, and then MoMA bought some pictures, and I was like, that's how I'm going to buy the camera. Um, yeah. It is. If it, it, I don't know if you guys have used it. So it kind of, for me, it's almost like, in my mind, I tell, tell myself it's like a hybrid between um, like film and digital. Yeah. I really love it. Um, and it's, I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling happy with it. To be honest with you, I just think that film renders like faces because it's round. I think that film renders faces better than digital because digital is, is square pixels. But that's just my own opinion. Um, I don't have anything to say. You know, but I, I, I do love that camera, and I think that, you know, silly as it sounds, I think in order to really enjoy the taking pictures, you got to really love your camera, you know, and yeah. I love that camera. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, you got a question? I really love your work, Lola. It's beautiful, and I'm looking forward to buying your book. Um, I just want to ask you a, a, a couple questions. One, one was, um, how did? Can you explain like how you you connected with the museums? Did you re, did you reach out to a curator? Did you reach out to a photography firm? Did or they reached out to you, or did you use social media, or how did it work for you? Um, yeah. So I um, on my sixtieth year on the planet, I said to myself, you must be grown up by now, Lola, because I just never really felt like a grown up, you know, like, um, as artists, we're always looking at colors or, you know, uh, putting things together and, you know, uh, I just felt like, uh, I just didn't really feel like, an, I've never felt like an adult. Um, and so, but when I turned six, I was like, well, you must be an adult now. So you're gonna like call these people or email these people and tell them, I'm ready for my, my studio visit. So that's what I did. Um, my, my, um, luckily, I have a friend that works at MoMA, and he had reached out to me about something else. And I was like, by the way, who's the, cu the photo curator? Because he needs to uh, make an appointment with me. <laughs> and so that's kind of how it started. And you know, uh, Clement, who was the, the head there at the time, um, he emailed me and said he'd like to see my work. And so, you know, Pen and Brush, uh, they were nice enough to let me take my work there because my apartment's small, like most apartments. So, um, you know, studio visit was, wasn't happening in my apartment. So I took all my work to, to, to Pen and Brush, and they looked at everything, you know, pretty much uh, all the many of the things that you saw and then some others. Um, and uh, I saw him take a picture of the cross-color stuff, and I thought that's probably what he likes. And sure enough, two weeks later, he's like, I want to see all the cross-color. So I dug under my bed, which is where the cross-color work has been living for the last 40 years. And uh, I got the boxes out and uh, took them you know, back to pen and brush, and that's pretty much how it worked. And then, you know, the MoMA collection kind of started the whole, you know, snowball effect, so to speak. So then the Whitney called pen and brush. They were like, hey, we'd like to look at some of Lola's work. And so, that's pretty much how it started. And I, and I have a, a, a gallerist now also, and so she does a lot of the fairs. And you know the fairs are boring for people who don't have money, um, but exciting for people who want to buy art. So we're, I'm on my way next week to uh, LA Freeze because uh, she's going to have some more of my work uh, there. So that's really, I just like, I was just like, I'm tired of this stuff. I'm going to, I put the word out and it, and it worked. Um, yeah. And also, I'm on, um, I am on Instagram. 
and my account got hacked. So it looks like I don't have a lot of followers because I don't <laughs> anymore. But if you feel free to, to um, follow me on uh, Flash 9, like the number, like the spelling N-I-N-E, and then the number 9. Um, so for those shy folks, I was real shy when I was younger. If you have some burning questions and you don't really feel like you want to say it aloud, feel free to uh, send me a message via uh, Instagram and I'll be happy to, to say hello. Was that the end of your question? Yeah, this is and thanks for saying you're going to buy my book. I'm really excited about it. Well, you know, it's, it. it's really, um, you know, there's all these firsts that are happening for me finally. And it's, it's uh, yeah, I'm happy. And there's one other question I have, and I'll make it short. Um, you know, during your decades of photography, I know I've been shooting a long time, and I know as the life of photographers, there's ups and downs. And I just, maybe you can just kind of explain when you were in the funky periods of your life where it was really like, you know, because your work is so like, was way ahead of, you know, the thought process and the images and it's so beautiful, it's so far ahead of, you know, where they were at at the time, like the cross processing example. But the thing is, as far as you say, as far as your feelings and as far as your, you know, your just the, getting up the stamina to keep on going without getting into the funk. Yeah, well, you know, one thing is um, both my parents were teachers and my mom um, encouraged me to become a teacher and I was like, I don't want to be like you, <laughs> you know. And um, so for a long time I bartended away to tables. Um, but basically I always had a job so I didn't have to rely on my photography. Um, so that's one thing. And then I eventually started teaching and I, and I loved it. Um, but, uh, you know, just one thing is that photographing makes me feel happy. So when I'm, not, when I'm not photographing, I find sometimes I feel like sluggish or something like that. But I go to the gym, so the gym also helps with the endorphins and stuff, right? Um, and, uh, you know, looking around and never seeing myself just gave me the courage, gave me the, the inspiration to continue. I mean, when I was younger, like, would look at a, a magazine stand, and there were never any, any people of color, you know, on the magazines. And now we have magazines by people of color, and so you see, you know, see an array of colors of faces. Um, and yeah, I mean, even now, like, uh, as a, you know, I'll call myself a black dyke, you know, like, if you think about the Grammys, there, it's, you know, there are a lot of, of black people that won, right, a uh, trans person, right? But you don't see any black, Dykes looking like me walking up there on the on the red carpet getting awards, you know. So still there's this this absence of seeing myself places, right? And so that continues to just make me think, I'm gonna just keep doing this, you know. I think that I have the blood of enslaved folks, and they didn't stop. And thinking about what they went through, you know, is not half as bad now. So. You know, just got to keep waking up every morning and, you know, doing it. Yeah. And thank you for, I appreciate your, your kind words. Hi. Um, I love your work. Thank you for sharing. So um, I'm just curious about, um, have you ever, um, like, going to a social movement and have you ever just done like observing and documenting or do you always participate in those movements and like be in your work so do when i go to social like movements like the next picture of this oh one, really I think. like that uh-huh yeah, yeah yeah so do you ever like just document what is happening or do you always like, participate in those well um, going back to my days of act up you all know like act up AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. So, uh, you know, I would, uh, I'd make a conscious uh, decision, like, uh, because, you know, we got arrested a lot uh, for these different demonstrations that we would do. There's some good footage of me getting arrested actually on, um, on YouTube. And it's really, uh, the timing is just, it just looks like it was edited, but it wasn't, you know, because they, they, they were uh, interviewing me and saying, what was I doing? And I was like, you know, we're demonstrating because the city's not doing enough for uh, HIV and AIDS. I think we called it AIDS back then, actually. And uh, right when I said that, the police 
like grabbed my arms and handcuffed me and pulled me away. It was uh, pretty interesting. But um, yeah, so I would either decide, did I want to, if I was planning, if I was planning on being arrested, I wouldn't bring my camera. But if I decided I just, if I wanted to take pictures, then I would take pictures and I wouldn't be so much a part of it. Um, but I, at first I was thinking you were saying, because I think that one thing about being a photographer that, um, that I love is that you can be in a, in a, a social environment um, and you could take pictures, but you don't really have to talk a lot. Um, you know, so you could feel like you're, you're being present, you're not like standing in the corner, but you can just be like, oh, I could take a picture, you take a picture, and then you just keep it moving, you know what I mean? So I, I don't know, I think, I guess there's something about us photographers about being a voyeur and sort of uh, that, that camera becomes kind of like this way, your way of communicating. I guess even like thinking about the photograph, right? That's the way that you communicate. And when I was younger, I used to just be like, you know, there it is, figure it out. But um, as I've gotten older, I suppose I've gotten more, uh, and also through teaching, I've gotten a lot more uh, talkative. And especially when we're talking about photography, I could talk forever. But at a party, I'm not the, you know, I'm not the sort of girl who's talking to everybody. I'm usually in the corner. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I, when, it's interesting also just to finish up, um, you know, when the, all the demonstrations were happening for Mr. Floyd, um, I actually didn't do any, you know, that was like the only time I really was in one. Um, I think I felt like, partly because of COVID um, and my age, and that time especially, like, you know, they were saying that how it was affecting people that were older. And um, I, I also felt like I had done my, my, my um, demonstrating that let the young people do it. And like, you know, I, I was amazed at how well, this is a little bit off, you know, the subject, but I was just amazed at the way that they organized. Uh, and they were even, like, one point I saw them doing, like, a teaching sign language, you know, to ha how to say uh, Black Lives Matters and stuff like that. And I was just like, wow, that it's, you know, they were just, uh, just going like that extra step that, that we had gone. And there's just one more thing that just is on my mind about ACT UP is that, so ACT UP was like mostly, uh, mostly white people. Um, uh, but there were a lot of lesbians of all colors there. Um, and, you know, a lot of us were caretakers during that time. And uh, I never thought about getting killed or shot when I went to those demonstrations. Never, you know. And then when you see these demonstrations nowadays, you know, depending upon the color of the people, you might get shot, you know, and that just kind of dawned on me. I was just like, wow, I, you know, we actually used to wear army kind of clothes because we were, you know, we call ourselves the army of lovers, um, but never thought about getting shot. No one got shot. In fact, we would get arrested and we all got out fine, you know, and so um, that's just that I, I kind of digress, but it was just kind of interesting. Anybody else? <laughs> I'll be more specific. I just wanted to ask a question about the book again. Um, where is it going to be available? Who's the publisher? And if, how you do people get if you if you Google it? "believable" and "new press," you'll see, it'll come up, and it, you can get it from other uh, places other than Amazon. But you can't get it on Amazon. But you can get it at um, Barnes and Noble. Basically, any place where they sell books, you can get it as of February twenty eighth. Oh, okay, I believe it, but it's believable. <laughs> it's, it's believable, and we're really looking forward to it, for your, to your book. And thank you, Lola Flash, for your activism, for your photography, and for being here tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.